Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We're going to get started. Um, my name is Josh Levy. I'm the director of the Center for the Arts. Thank you so much for being here for Everything Everywhere All at West, a conversation between Daniel Kwan and Mary Jane Rubenstein. I wanted to just offer a very huge thank you to our speakers, um, the two of whom have been in conversation for a little while now and are sort of letting us listen in into a, a really intimate dialogue between them, between different disciplines and media and genres. Unfortunately, MJ Rubenstein is not able to be with us in person, um, so we're actually going to do something quite innovative. Thank you, Scott. It's just have Daniel Kwan and MJ on Zoom talking to each other, and then Daniel will come. He's in the building. He's going to come in for the Q&A. So there'll be like multiple universes, sorry, cheap joke, um, happening all at once in this space. Before we get started, I also want to thank everyone who made this event possible, the Albritton Center for the Study of Public Life, the Science and Society Program, the Religion Department, the College of Film, and Moving Image. I especially want to thank Ariana Maloku, Logan Ludwig, Mark Longenecker, John Kehoe, and the Bon App team, and the crew from the DDC Production Club who are here filming tonight's event. Speaking of filming, there will be a short meet and greet with Daniel after out in the lobby, and we do have one request, which is no requests for selfies or photos with Daniel. That's mostly so he can get to talk to as many of you as possible and not get caught up in a photo line, so we'd really appreciate you respecting that. Lastly, I want to extend a huge thank you to Scott Higgins for his partnership on this event. Higgins is the Charles W. Fries Professor and Chair of Film Studies, Director of the College of Film and the Moving Image, and Curator of the Wesleyan Cinema Archives. It's my pleasure to turn the mic over to Scott to introduce our guests. All right. Thanks, Rash. Um, Right, my job is to introduce people who don't need an introduction, which is just about my skill level today. So, let me introduce to you uh, Mary Jane Rubenstein, who is Professor of Religion, it's a long list, Science in Society, FGSS, and Dean of Social Sciences. Um, her books include Strange Wonder, the, clo uh, the Closure of Metaphysics and the Opening of Awe, Worlds Without End, The Many Lives of the Multiverse, Pantheologies, Gods, Worlds, and Monsters, and Astropia, the Dangerous Religion of the Corporate Space Race. She will be discussing life, the universe, everything with Daniel Kwan, who is a filmmaker, writer, producer. Um, his works include the Turn Down for What video in 2014, uh, <laughs> of which he is also the star, and um, the best film of that year. Also, Swiss Army Man, uh, 2016, and a little movie called Everywhere, <laughs> Everything Everywhere All at Once, which was from, I, I, I haven't seen it. So, um, he is also a author of children's books. Through A24, he is selling two books pitched at Little Ones. One of them is called 24 Minutes to Bedtime. The other is, I'll get to the bottom of this. And uh, it's for all of us, not just for kids. So. I'm insanely happy and pleased to introduce to the, you to them on screen, and then Daniel will magically jump off the screen and, and come and see you in person. Um, and I have also been gifted with asking the very first question of the day. Um, they'll appear there soon. But my question to them is, uh, what are we doing here? There you go. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I came across MJ's book, The Worlds Without Ends, um, in the middle of researching the script for Everything Everywhere All at Once. I, I, I'm a little bit of a nerd. I love to hyper-focus, and when it comes time to write, I need to know everything I can about a subject. And so I read a lot of multiverse books. Most of them were great, but a lot of them mostly focused on just the science of the... Uh, the science behind the theory and just the, some of the history of, of the different interpretations of quantum physics. But uh, when, I, when I came across Mary's, uh, MJ's uh, book, I got super excited because suddenly here was someone asking these really impossibly large questions that were unanswerable and uh, about these bigger things of morality and, um, and, and God and, and philosophy and spirituality. Um, within the context of the multiverse. And so it became one of my like guiding lights while writing the, the script. So I got really excited uh, that my movie did well enough that I could reach out to um, one of my uh, celebrity <laughs> um, 
uh, my academic celebrities that I, 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 I've been admiring for a little bit from afar. And um, so she invited me to be here, and that is why I'm excited to be here because um, me and me and MJ both share a love for interdisciplinary conversation and studies. Um, and I really thought this would be a wonderful opportunity for filmmakers to hear from someone like MJ and for philosophy students to hear from someone like me. Um, and I hope that this kind of conversation can start a lot of mini conversations at your campus. So that's my answer to that question. <laughs> Hooray! We are so excited that you are here, Dan. I am so sorry um, to everybody that it's my fault that we're on these screens looking at you. Um, I, you know, one gets the Rona and then one just has it, and that's that's how it happens. But um, so I'm, I'm I'm so glad that we were able to pivot and do this this way. Um, yeah, I we're we're here. We're here. I I didn't um, I didn't know this story. I it's it's sort of amazing to me. I had no idea. Um, that Dan had read uh, this book, that anybody really had read this book. One writes these books and doesn't know <laughs> if they're ever going to reach anybody at all. Um, but I certainly saw the film, the majestic magisterial film, um, the minute it came out. Um, I, I'm not really in the, in the habit of seeing movies all that often at the moment. I've got two little kids. We can never get anywhere. But I was like, we are getting a babysitter. It's a multiverse movie. And it's not about Spider-Man. Like, we are going. We have to go. Um, I've heard amazing things about it. Also, Jamie Lee Curtis with whom I am in a bit of love. Um, I mean, even in that character, which is hard. It's hard to love her in that character. Um, so we went, we saw the movie. Um, I was, of course, astonished by it. And then, you know, a couple of years later, if you've, if you've seen um, Daniel Kwan's films and his, um, his, his music videos and his, you will know that um, things often come to characters, I hope this is okay to say, Dan, like, out, like drop in on them out of the sky like a lot a lot of stuff like things like literally come through the ceiling right or they come through the windshield or that they come through into the um things just like in um and i just got i got this uh email kind of bursting in um tumbling down out of the sky asking me to write something uh, a screenplay book that they're putting that a24 is putting together for everything everywhere um and saying, you know, would you be willing to write a little, a little essay about it, maybe cult uh, concentrating on the ethics of the multiverse, um, you know, what it means to think about worlds, um, how it might even help us think ethically. Um, and I don't know, for, for those of you academics out there, you know that you get an invitation like this, and usually it's like, okay, can you give me like six months? Can you give me a year and a half? Can you give me, and I was like, I, I do, next week, I will do it next, I will, do you, you need it yesterday, I have it. I'm sure I have something. Um, it was so exciting. I was so delighted. Um, and so Dan and I got into conversation that way when I sent a draft and um, and we got onto Zoom and I just thought, wow, like our, our we, we were talking about so many things, um, certainly the ethics of the multiverse, but we also moved into the idea of messianic uh, entrepreneurs in outer space and the like religious valences of AI and things like that. So I thought this would be a really fun thing to bring to campus. So um, that's, that's what we're bringing here. Um, Dan, I will. I'll just start uh, by asking you a question, if it's okay. Um, sure. You've got a you've got a movie um, that uh, employs a uh, device, this this device of parallel universes, of multiple worlds, of um, perhaps even an infinite number of universes. Um, can I ask? Did you try? Did you start out trying to write a multiverse story? Were you like, oh, multiverse is cool. I want to write a multiverse story, um, and then kind of like find the character of Evelyn and Evelyn and, and work her through that, um, or, or did you start more with um, the story of uh, an immigrant woman struggling to keep her family business alive, struggling to keep her family relationships alive, um, and then that somehow sort of called forth this trope, this genre of of multiple worlds? How did you get there? Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of us here are probably, um, we're, we're generative, we're making things all the time, and our brains are always um, latching onto different ideas and concepts. And I, I like to think that I'm just collecting all of these things and letting them float in zero um, gravity. And every now and then there's a, a bit of an attraction and things start to stick together until suddenly it feels like, oh, something you can actually hold. And so, um, yes, Multiverse was, was floating in there. Um, I got, uh, I was talking about this during lunch actually with Scott, I got introduced to the idea of the multiverse in a very roundabout way. Again, like, you know, random collisions. I was watching the film, the documentary, um, Sherman's March, um, which is, you know, it's a it's about a documentary filmmaker going through um, Sherman's March, but in parallel, he's also meeting a lot of women and it's like a parallel between just like this misogynistic man, you know, dating a lot of women and all this stuff. Anyways, long story short, he dates this linguistic professor or a linguist of some sort and she starts talking about modal realism um, which is essentially it's um, 
taking the modality of language and every time you swap out um, a word in a, in a sentence, what if you kind of imagine what if that is real? What if every time you, you if I swapped out, I'm just holding these water bottles here. If I swap this out for that in a sentence, what if somewhere out there that actually exists? And then um, I started going down the wicked rabbit hole and realizing that uh, language has a way of talking about infinity. Math has a way of talking about infinity. Physics has a way of talking about infinity. Um, and I was like, oh, what is what is our narrative version of that? And so uh, the film really started with this idea of, of what if I could capture the feeling of infinity in a very finite thing, which is a, a film. Um, and then as I started to um, follow that thread, I realized it, be, it started to become this really beautiful mirror for our current times, which is um, this post internet hyper hyper connected world where we are um, constantly being bombarded by too much and um, our, our paleolithic animal brains can't process it at all and so everything feels infinite in all the bad ways and good ways and so that's where it started um, and then naturally of course um, with a story that complicated I really just wanted to fall back on what I knew for the characters and I, I had been wanting to work on a film about my family and my, my parents specifically because I I think most of my work starts with questions of like, how do how yeah, how does infinity work and how does my how do my parents work? You know, like that was really where it started, and that all stuck together and became a, a story um, that felt worth you know pursuing for many years. Mm -hmm. um, if I could ask you a question now, I, I, I one of the things that I, I, I found really fascinating about um, your book is you articulate this really. This important feeling I was feeling um, at the time, um, I think I read your book around 2015 or something like that, 2016, and uh, I hadn't been able to articulate it up until then. And it's, it's this, this idea that um, why do myths exist, right? Why, why, do, why do we always tell stories um, throughout time? And it was always humanity trying to grapple with the edges of our understanding, right? That, 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 that place of the unknowable, that, that intersection or the... Uh, the threshold between what we know and what we can't know. Um, and that's what we're, that, that's why we tell stories. Like, why did we tell the story of Zeus throwing lightning? It's because we didn't know what the fuck that was. Like, oh my God, that light, that, that burst of energy, what was it? I'll tell a story so we can understand it. And um, this movie um, kind of uh, was a product of that. But I kind of want to talk, I want to ask you about um, that, ex the exploration, the, the desire to explore that intersection of, of, of what is known and what is unknowable. Where, how has that guided you through all your books? Because your books are all very different, but they're also so fascinating and the kind of, they, they ask the kind of questions that I, I rarely see being asked in, in you know, in the, the public sphere. Um, so how has that, that kind of space driven you? Um, yeah, I think that the, um, I love the example of Zeus because the way we talk about um, myth is, well, before we knew anything, we would say, that, that thunder is the god who's throwing it. But now what we understand is, and we, we have this notion that we've um, like grown up out of myth, that we've graduated from it, and that we used to have it, but we used to have stories, right? And now we have truth, and we used to have myth, and now we have science. Um, what I get really excited about are the times that in particular the natural sciences um, start doing stuff that sounds and looks to me a lot like myth. Right. It's a person who's trained up in religious studies. Um, so I, I think just like you, you know, just happening to run into somebody who was um, talking about modal realism, David Lewis's work, all that. Um, I just happened to have this random colleague at the University of Central Arkansas, like, I mean, just like out in the middle of um, who was like, hey, I need you to come here and talk about energy. And I was like, I have nothing to say about energy. And he's like, I need you to talk about it. And I was like, I, I don't know what it is. I don't I have no idea. I have no I can't. Um, and he just would not let go. He wrote every week and then every day. And I was like, fine, I'll talk. And I think I, I think I like went to the New York Times. It was like, what's going on with energy right now? Like, <laughs> um, and what was going on was that uh, that these two independent teams of scientists had just discovered uh, what they started calling dark energy, which is to say um, the, the, the pressure of empty space itself um, that is not just expanding the universe, we all know the universe is expanding, but it's accelerating the expansion of the universe. So uh, galaxies are not just moving away from each other, but they're moving away from each other faster and faster with every passing uh, like second. Um, and 
this discovery of dark energy, it was made physicists who were interviewed about it just like freak out. And it really surprised me. They were like, ah, oh, we didn't expect this. It's ugly. It's disgusting. Nobody saw it coming. I hate it. People said like, it's like hell without the fire. It's going to be lonely. It's a, the cosmos is lonely, dark and awful and miserable. And I was like, where is all this affect coming from? Right? These are the kinds of people who tell you like, yeah, you know, the star is going to become a red dwarf and the whole solar system is going to unravel. But like, it's okay. This is just, but, but somehow this really freaked them out. And I won't go into it, um, but the freak out became so extensive that for reasons, again, I, I mean, I can, but I won't, um, that uh, it really, this discovery was at the end of the millennium, um, reignited um, interest in uh, parallel universes, multiple worlds among physicists themselves. They started at that point, now this idea had been around since the second half of the 20th century, but they started saying like, oh my God, this is positing so many problems for us that we're gonna have to go to those old lunatics from the 60s, this was the many worlds interpretation, the 80s, this is the in, uh, uh, inflationary universe, and ask them actually what they were on about because it seems like we may actually be living in a multiverse. We may actually be living in a multiverse. Uh, and there may be, in fact, um, an infinite number of infinitely sized universes in which all possible instances of every possible configuration of space-time are actually happening all, all at once, right? Um, and somewhere around, it's like, what is happening with these scientists? I went, of course, and I, I, I don't know if it, I don't know who's in the audience, but I went to my friends in the physics department. I was like, hey guys, what's going on with the multiverse? And they were like, oh my god, those guys are nuts. And I went to my friends in astronomy. I was like, hey, what's going on in the multiverse? And they were like, these people are crazy people. Um, but at the edges, you were talking about edges. At the edges of um, cosmology of like respectable physics and respectable cosmology. Um, physics itself with this question of dark energy and the question of the multiverse was like tumbling into um, something like religion, right? They, they started telling stories again and I got so excited. Um, not because I wanted to, you know, try to confirm that like old things that Democritus had said were true or that old things that, um, I don't know, that like Hindu cosmology had said were true or anything like that. Um, but because it seemed to me that the sciences in at, like, and again, at their limits, at their edges, um, were producing new myths and that's cool, right? Um, so uh, so I guess that's, if that, I, I, don't, I don't know why we tell stories, but I know that we do. And I know that we often tell ourselves that we don't. Um, and I love the places where it becomes apparent that even for those of us who have tried to free ourselves as much as possible from myth, myth kind of gets you and bites you in the back a little bit and says, like, here I am. That's that's fascinating way to put it because uh, that is in a lot of ways what happened to me. I, I grew up very religious, evangelical without the name, you know, basically fundamentalist. Um, I didn't learn much about evolution except for um, in, in classes where I had to learn to argue against it, you know, if that makes sense. And so it was it's like, I, I kind of was a late bloomer when it came to science. And so when I did finally leave the church, I chased after that stuff. I chased after the, the data and the rash, like just reasoning and, and pure um, intellectual um, rigor. Like, like I, I felt like, oh, this is, this, this is the energy of the universe. This is what glue is all here. If I can understand it all, maybe um, I will save myself from the fact that I just lost God. Um, and then I found uh, I found this edge here, um, the most. And one of the things that really sh really shocked me when I read your book was I was reading another book about the multiverse, and they they described the fine tuning problem, right? The problem with um, everything in our universe is is perfectly fine tuned to support life in a way that feels almost impossible. Like if you were to flip a coin a million times, you would we would never get the gravity at, at this level and the, like, the carbon at this. You know, and the book kind of just talked about it. It was like, isn't that wild? So that means we have to, we like, the only explanation is the multiverse. We have to have a million infinite flips of the coin to get to a place where we could have life. And when we were leaving on that, you know, one in a billion chance um, universe. Um, but what your book did was kind of take it full circle and say, like, we're just inventing this shit because we don't know. And we're too afraid to stare at anything we don't know. And what I love about art and what I love about storytelling and what I feel is... Um, sometimes gets lost in in our, our our at least in my industry's way of looking at art and story and the way we talk about it and write about it is everything is so and I was just talking about this to you with you MJ before everything is so intellectualized and uh, 
you know, as you are watching a movie, you're thinking, how am I going to review this on Letterboxd? What am I going to compare, what, what other film am I going to compare this to? And through, like, what other genre, um, you know, lens will I dissect this film? What score am I going to give it? You know, you're, you're already putting it and capturing it in boxes before it's been able to move through you um, emotionally and uh, uh, spiritually. And so this film was really me trying to, or me and Daniel trying to like shake all that away. Just be like, don't, don't let, don't let yourself um, pin things down too soon with this movie. Let like, oftentimes I hear people say, the moment I let go, I was able to have fun. Before then, I hated the movie, you know. But the moment I let go, I was like, thank God, that's what the film is asking you to do. Um, but the the film does it literally, but also um, narratively, the the film is sort of pleading us, like begging us to stop trying to find uh, all the answers in all the chaos and, and everything we're seeing and instead really use a lot of wisdom and heart and spirituality to f discern um, what things are worth focusing on and what things aren't worth, worth focusing on. And because I, if, I, if I could sum up what I feel like is uh, in my own life, and, and, and I think other people will relate with this, one of my biggest problems in my life and, the, and, the, and at the source of so many things is I cannot... I do not know what to pay attention to because the, the, the world itself will <laughs> doesn't pay attention to the things I think I should be paying attention to. Um, so as someone with ADHD, I'm thinking about the attention economy a lot. And um, this, this film is a way for me to kind of try to free myself from it, I guess. Well, I think as, this is, as, as you know, because um, we've talked about this, um, the thing that makes this film different for me than any other multiverse story, except maybe, maybe Ted Chang's Anxiety is the Busyness of Freedom. I don't know if you know that one. Like that one, it's... Which one, which one is that one? I've read, I read his, um, his first collection of short story, yeah. the story of Us or whatever. Uh, the, right. Anxiety is the Busyness of Freedom is in his second book, and it's um, a story of uh, people who um, have access to like iPads in which they can speak to their parallel selves, like the one who decided actually to go to run away with that person who asked them when they stayed behind, or the one who decided to go to this college rather than that college, or the one whose dad didn't die, or the one who's whatever. They can um, talk to these other versions of themselves and try sort of therapeutically to process themselves in relation to these other selves. Um, that uh, that stand that and your film stand out to me as as the best treat like narrative treatments of this multiverse structure because it seems like what usually happens is uh, exactly as you're saying in the in the in the world of physics um, when the physicists do when physicists do kind of champion the multiverse it's as an explanation as you're saying for the fine tunings it's a way of saying well look <laughs> yeah right that it's totally improbable that gravity would have this kind of value. It's totally improbable that the cosmological constant would be like this. It's totally improbable that the weak nuclear force would have the value that it has. Uh, therefore, either there's an intelligent, benevolent God who is like setting all of the like the controls just right, which is impossible. So we have to set it. Or there are an infinite number of universes in which every value takes on every possibility. Most universes don't work. Every once in a while, the universe works, and we happen to be in one of those. So as you're saying, right, God becomes a replacement for the multiverse. Um, but then once you've got there, once you've got there with these, you know, multiverse cosmologists, they're like, therefore, we have our world. And they don't spend any time imagining what those other worlds might look like, right? There's no, there's no, there's no description of it. There's no, um, so you turn elsewhere to, you know, um, I don't know, Spider-Man or like the, all the Marvel movies, that, like Doctor Strange that make use of this multiverse trope to think like, okay, will you tell me what another world looks like? Because it seems to me that the promise of the multiverse as a genre, as a trope, as a device, is that it might actually allow us to think differently about the world we're in by breaking up open our sense of what possibilities are, right? Um, so you look to these Marvel movies and it's like, oh no, they're just imagining an infinite number of worlds so that they can wage warfare on an infinite number of worlds. It's, it's the same kind of process. It's just like you get to do it in a pink world, in a blue world, in a purple world, it's stuff. Um, and the thing that I find so remarkable about everything everywhere is concentrated for me in that moment when, um, and is on the staircase. So I hope folks have seen the movie recently, but there's a there's a bagel behind her. There's an everything bagel, like a real live everything bagel, a literal everything bagel behind her swirling and um, drawing everything into it. 
uh, and her daughter, Joy, whose name has been sort of stretched hilariously and absurdly into Joe Tapaki, is, is standing in front of the bagel, threatening to throw herself into it. And Evelyn is trying to prevent her from throwing herself into the void, into nothing. Um, and as she's trying to prevent her daughter from throwing herself into the nothing, like a bunch of goons are trying to prevent her from preventing her daughter. from. So they're trying to stop her so that Joe Tapaki right, is, is, is annihilated. And these goons come up the staircase to try to get Evelyn. She, of course, is trained up in all of these different universes where she was a sushi chef and where she was a sign spinner and where she was um, a, uh, like a kung fu star and all these things. So she's got all these, all these uh, tactics and all these skills. Um, and also, she's traveled through every possible world. So she's seen it and she's understood it and she's um, seen from every possible perspective. And the way she does battle with each of these goons who comes up to get her is that she looks at them, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong, Dan, but in my reading at least, she looks at them and can see all of their possible lifelines at once. Um, not for the sake then of like annihilating them, but for the sake of like seeing their best self and saying, aha, 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 I see there's something you need and I can see what it is and I can see what your best self ends up getting and then she gives it to them. And so she does, so rather than destroying each of them, she fulfills each of them, right? And she gives, she, um, this to me, this is all a way of talking about ADHD, <laughs> all a way of talking about the, the way that this film concentrates that I don't know where to look, right? The, or I, I'm looking in every possible direction. Um, into like transformative possibility that actually heals relationships and like fixes lives and fixes um, and that's what I think is so amazing about this film it really allows us to think um, about other worlds and other possibilities that are actually other and actually different and that ultimately end up disrupting um, you know the violence of the everyday order instead of just perpetuating it yeah thank you um, that is a um, <laughs> that was definitely one of the things that got us really excited about the ending was the moment we were like because basically, I, I find, um, uh, there's probably film students here, sometimes you're, you're, you're excited about many different things when, you, when you're, you're chasing a film or any project, and you find these contradictions that feel irresolvable, or like uh, unreconcilable. You can't, you can't put them together and you get frustrated, so you cut one of them out. And that's why you, you, a, lot of, a lot of stories that are, are getting made um, feel like uh, reductive or, or simplified versions of, of the world, um, just because that, you know, we do it all the time. We're always reducing things because that's what we have to do. Um, but I, I, I really um, encourage kids or film people, anyone, to uh, seek out those contradictions. And for us, because like, because that's where I think that's where our creative uh, synergy happens. We had this problem where like we love action movies. I love Kill Bill and The Matrix and all these, you know, whatever. And I really wanted to make one of those. Like, I grew up on all the old kung fu films um, with my dad. Watch bringing them from Hong Kong. Um, but we're also like both uh, pacifists who uh, really don't think the world needs more of that, right? And that contradiction was really uncomfortable for us to sit in for a while. Um, and rather than look away from it, like when you lean into that kind of thing, you're at, what you're actually looking at is like the, the, the places in which um, our culture and our conversation hasn't, um, hasn't processed something. Because if, I, if I, I couldn't process it and I couldn't see it being processed in the world, um, that that's actually an opportunity, and so it becomes a, a place where we were able to metabolize something. It's like, how can we make a film that is just as satisfying, just as fun as uh, you know, John Wick headshotting people in the you know in the face, um, but filled with love, empathy, and understanding. And so that became sort of one of our, our our targets that we were trying to hit. One of our many targets, like, oh, if we could hit that target, if we could get close to a bullseye, that would be so thrilling because. Uh, I haven't seen it and I feel like we need it right now um, because there's some, uh, you know, talking about the attention economy, what does the attention economy incentivize for? It incentivizes for anything that makes us scared, angry, addicted, hits the dopamine. Um, kindness is a slow burn, you know, and empathy is kind of invisible. It's not going to trigger a lot of the that um, lizard brain response that, you know, um, is going to, to get people excited and share online, which then, you know, you're not going to find as much success as, or it's like 10 times harder. And people do do it, and we're not talented enough to figure out how to do that. And so we had to do it our own way. And so, um, yeah, I'm glad you bring up that that ending because that ending was such a aha moment for the whole film and also a incredible obstacle that we didn't know how to tackle. Um, because I, I always say I want to 
chase after films that I don't think I can make. Um, mm. so that I can become the filmmaker, through the process of making the film, I become the filmmaker who can make that movie. Um, so this, this movie was impossible. When we started writing, I was like, I literally have no idea how we're gonna pull this off, but I can trust my crew and I can trust myself and we'll, fit, we'll find our way there. But um, I think right now, the, our, our, our world does need more imagination and more storytelling. And I'll reframe it. There's a lot of imagination, a lot of good storytelling happening. Our world needs that stuff to poke through better somehow, and it's not—it's not the storyteller's fault. The system has made it really hard to, but like, finding ways to, um, <laughs> to, uh, I guess, mimetically hitchhike some of this stuff to things that do do, um, you know, actually get talked about, actually get shown, is, is something that uh, me and Shiner have been talking about ever since um, our YouTube days. Um, we always say that we uh, we were subconsciously trained the algorithm without realizing it. You know, when we were in college, there was no discussion of the algorithm. No one, no one even understood that that's how the social media or the internet worked. Um, but we could sense it and we started building towards the algorithm, trying to please this thing that would give us more views, which would help our careers. And it felt really empty. And that emptiness led us to try to see it. Okay, again, that contradiction. I want to make meaningful stuff, <laughs> but the algorithm doesn't want me to do it. Okay, that's an interesting contradiction. Can I try to pull those things together? Um, and I'm going to lean into that and I'm going to go so hard. I'm going to make stuff that is like so viral and so interesting and you can't even look away from it. And I'm going to execute on, on, on as best I can with the budget that I have, but I'm going to fill it with so much of my personality and my sincerity and my authenticity because I think sometimes that stuff is, is harder to, um, to come by. Yeah. And harder to break through. Yeah, I love thinking about the genre as like kung fu empathy. Like, yeah. I'm gonna heal you, and I'm gonna heal you, and I'm gonna heal you. I, I feel I, like if anyone here was inspired by that, just go take it, take it into a genre like I, I, you know, nice core, right? It's like just go do it. Go take a. I don't know. Me and Shire have been thinking about because like people keep sending us um, things to adapt. They're like, hey, do you guys want to do the next Mortal Kombat movie? And we're like, not really. But then, like, I played a lot more Kombat growing up, so I know that there's a thing called friendship. I don't know if you know this. At the end of when you when you win a battle in Mortal Kombat, you can you can type it, you can hit the right code, and you can do a fatality, which means like pulling someone's heart out of their chest or whatever, right? I know that, that's Mortal Kombat. Um, that's like classic Mortal Kombat. But if you type another code in the later Mortal Kombat, you can actually do the opposite, and they do a friendship, which means someone pulls out a cake and gives it to them, and then it's very sweet. It's like a it's a tongue in cheek thing. And then me and Sean are like, we could do a whole Mortal Kombat movie where someone just tries to win the Mortal Kombat tournament, doing nothing but friendship and empathy. And it would totally be ripping off our other movie, but it would just be like, that's fine. The world needs more of it. We got to be really um, <clears throat> imagination expanding in this moment, um, especially because right now, again, everything is incentivized towards polarization. Um, um, I keep talking about incentives. I keep talking about, um, I think often in terms of systems and something I really like about your writing and your work, MJ, is that you, you're you able to very clearly talk about <clears throat> the, um, the constructs that our society is built in terms of myth and story and um, how, you know, you, you talk about like God is a construct, maybe uh, capitalism, money, all these, you know, these things that we all collectively trust in and say this is the story that we all are going to believe in um <clears throat> and that then um drives behavior and that drives everything um but <clears throat> what would you say are some of the biggest drivers and what, what's the biggest story that is driving us right now if you i mean or like one of them you don't have to say the one but like what are some of the stories that you think um would be useful for us to identify well, this is great because I was going to ask you um, just if you would talk a little bit about um, the next big thing that you might be working on. So it may be that we're talking about the same thing, which, which is to say um, in this realm and this um, as far as it relates to some of the things we've been talking about today, um, I think the next the next big thing, the thing that everybody seems to be talking about certainly is the rise of AI. Um, and we, you know, we talk about it on campus in very functional ways, right? How am I sign an essay if ChatGPT can write one? Um, how do I figure out if an essay has like a kind of bot-y feel to it? 
like, do, what, what kind of conversation do I have with a student? Or um, how do I get students to like really use AI in a creative way? And if it, how do we, like, how do we, um, these, these very, um, what kinds of jobs will be there for our students when they graduate and what won't be there, right? Will it thankfully get rid of some, you know, what, what David, Harry Frankfurt calls bullshit jobs? Um, but how do we prepare our students not to want or have bullshit jobs and to have real ones? Um, and how do we protect that from, so we, we again, it, for a very like idealistic and abstract and like philosophical university, we talk about AI in these very, very concrete ways, very functional ways. Um, I think the question that we don't often ask is like, what is this thing and why do we keep talking about it? Um, and why are we, what kind of, uh, what kind of role is it, um, is it, coming increasingly to occupy for us, um, mythically and uh, ontologically, like what is it? Um, and we tend to think about AI as though it's some, I, I don't know, some like magical, mythical creature that just like, dropped in out of the sky, like the ceiling or came through the windshield or came through the, um, and here, of course, my little ears start pricking up because I'm like, oh, this is, this is one of those times, this is one of those times when we're all getting together to talk about this thing um that human beings created you know that we made up um that has somehow grown beyond what feels like our control right um, and that now is uh coming to dominate and threaten us in such a way that we talk about it as though it just dropped in out of the sky um this feels very familiar to me as a person who studied what people said about god for a really long time right um and it, it, it's it, it's not until like the 18th and 19th century that some philosophers first start saying well no actually they say it like 2500 years ago um but like in terms of like the dead white guys the dead white guys in like the 19th century start saying like oh wait this is really weird we made up this this guy God and then stuck him in the sky and now he's coming to have all this power over us. Um, the same is true. You were talking about God. You were talking about money. The same is true for the economy. You know, we we, we create the economy. <laughs> we create everything that is the economy, both by by laboring um, and also by consuming and also just by our faith in the economy. Right. This is what makes the economy. And then the economy stands over us as something that we just have absolutely no control over. Um, I am. I am. Uh, I am, I am concerned that it seems like we are behaving in similar ways with, with respect to AI. And, um, and I think that that needs to, to be thought through, what it is that makes us want to talk about it in these particular ways, um, and how it is that we might do some like good old Marxist analysis and just reappropriate that stuff and just um, and, and, and come to um, remember where it comes from um, and how it is, in fact, that we can you know, use these, these tools um, toward our ends, but in that case, we have to figure out what our ends are and we start agreeing on some like base, basic eth ethical precepts. Um, so I don't know. Um, what about you? What do you, and we should, then we should probably let you, um, do your, uh, are you going to like, are you going to crowd surf? Just like hop into the, um, we should, we should release you in a minute, but tell us, tell us quickly if you would, <laughs> what you're thinking about. Yeah. I mean, in, you know, our, our, our next film is, is, trying to tackle, like our last film tried to tackle everything and we, and we didn't manage to do everything. You know, like that was the joke and we missed, um, we got we got a lot of stuff, but we missed a lot of things. This next film is is going to try again. Um, and, and so that means AI is in it, the, our systems are in it, our economy is in it, church is in it. Every, you know, we're trying to um, process the world in a way that hopefully will help me understand what's going on a little bit more. Um, but with like something like AI, the thing that I realized, and, and, and Joseph Campbell talks about this, like how you can, every, any object, any thing um, can lead to a, prof a profundity, uh, to something sacred, to the great mystery, as he calls it. He says, if you take something as simple as like, I'll just say like this, this, this is my rental car key fob. You put a circle around it and you ask it a question. That will lead to another question, which will lead to another question, which will lead to another question. And eventually you get to a point where there's something you cannot answer. Um, and so this is, he calls this, this is, this is consecration. This is a moment of making anything sacred. He says that at that moment, the key fob becomes the, the still center of the spinning universe. Um, and when you do that with AI, um, just to kind of, kind of do what you're saying, which is like, everything is very practical when we talk about AI, same thing in the film industry. Everyone's like, will AI replace actors? How do we make sure that, you know, ed editing and post people aren't completely obliterated that whole industry, you know, um, very practical stuff, and that that, that makes sense. We're very, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're very practical and, and survival-based um, creatures. We want to know that we are safe. 
Um, but with with film, with with AI and film and storytelling, the more I look at the thing, the more I realize, um, the more you get reminded of of again back to the beginning why we tell stories or why I tell stories, and I think that kind of stuff is actually really important. Um, I'm not necessarily anti AI, but I am really scared of AI in this current system and in the hands of this collective um, uh, collective story. If that makes sense, the, like we have proven to not be great stewards of technology, even when we promise great things and we achieve those great things, it often comes at the price of us ignoring so much of what else can happen. I mean, this is why we are in the, the climate crisis problem right now. Like we, we, we're we like, great, we can we can get all this energy, we can we can be super productive, all this convenience is going to bring up, uh, our, you know, everyone's quality of life, that's amazing. That, that's what we're pitched as progress. Um, but what gets what gets what gets sacrificed in in the name of convenience is, is something that I think is really important for us to to talk about. It's a very reductive way to look at the the intersection of like technology progress and our our um, our stewardship of it. But like every new technology, again, very reductive, is trying to bring a efficiency to the system that that gains convenience. And what happens when you tip over to too convenient? Then the thing becomes disposable. Uh, I have not opened this water bottle. I try not to drink water bottles. And we know that these things, we have become so good at making these things so efficiently, they've become disposable. And so we don't think about it. We've done this to shoes. We've done this to iPhones. We've done this to um, dates. Think about Tinder. How, how, how much faster are you willing to let someone go or ghost someone now because of how convenient it is to reach them? I'm really, like, in the arts, everyone's talking about how no one's going to watch movies anymore it's because there's a lot of different reasons you know video games are more fun TikTok is great but at its core there's also this problem where our industry has made um film and there's good and bad to this i'm not saying this is this is not a moral judgment uh film is so readily available you can stream anything you want to so you just scroll all day on netflix and then finally like i don't know i'll watch real housewives we've made it so convenient and I'm worried about what this new technology, what efficiencies will we gain through AI and what will it make more disposable? And we know that on our current timeline, on this current planet, we can't afford to dispose of it much more. We are, we, you know, we are running up against our planetary limits. And so to me, the, that story of progress for the sake of progress has to be re-examined when we think about AI and we think about technology because if you look at social media, we were told we were going to become more connected and have more community and be more informed. Mm -hmm. And those things technically were true for, for a lot of people. But overall, we ended up we, in a world more polarized, more depressed, and, and honestly less informed because uh, anyone could find any version of the truth they wanted. And we're still dealing with the ramifications of this thing, of social media, and we haven't caught up. Our regulation has not caught up. What happens if we allow the same thing to happen with AI? And so it forces us to really ask. So I think AI will save us, but not because it's going to, to be the savior that comes and plucks us out of the out of the, out of our problems. It will save us because it will become a mirror to ourselves and show us. It will become the ghost of Christmas future and show us like where where is this trajectory taking us? And if we don't want to go there, who do we want to be? <laughs> and what 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 future do we actually want? And and how does AI factor into all that? Um, and <clears throat> anyway, so uh, I'm very excited to be um, talking about this stuff, and I wish I could, you know, I could talk about it for hours and hours and hours. But um, I encourage you all to really think deeply about that question that you asked earlier, MJ. Like, who do we want to be? Um, I, I heard someone say uh, AI has the potential to amplify any part of the human experience by ten thousand, mm -hmm. by a million, whatever. What part of us do we want to amplify? And we're not going to be able to make those choices unless it's a systemic choice. And so right now, what does the system amplify? Ask that, yourself that question, and you will know what AI will amplify as well. Um, okay, that's that. I'll, I'll leave it at that, because this has nothing to do with the film now, and now I'm just starting to move into the weird, uh, weird directions. You are amazing. Get out there. The people okay. need you. Um, Thank, Thank you.
Thank you, Scott. Um, I don't know if she can hear us, but one more round of applause for MJ. I'm such a, yeah, this is great. Um, yeah, we're just going to do a super casual q and I can't get to all of you. I'm so sorry, but I'll try to move fast. Um, and just as a chat. Hello? Oh. Just as a challenge to you, just because I think it's, it's fun to give people challenges, um, I've been answering questions about this movie for like three years, it feels like. It, it's not really that long. Um, so if you, if you want a challenge, try to think of a question that I haven't been asked. I'm just curious what you guys will come up with. Um, all right, we have a question. Yeah, so the question is, did the way the internet fractured our attention, was that a inspiration or, or factored into the film? A hundred percent, yes. This movie is just a blatant metaphor for what it feels like to be uh, too online, or, or even a little bit online. Um, these, these, these um, you all know this, I'm repeating this again, but these algorithms have really figured out how to optimize our time on site. They're like, how can we keep this person on for as long as possible? And that is by triggering us, right? Like the, the fight or flight thing is one of the most innate parts of our biology. And it means that we don't actually get the time to pay attention to things that actually matter. And so at the beginning of the movie, you see a mother, a daughter, a family who are just so spread thin and so distracted that they keep looking past each other. And in the act of looking past each other, their love feels like hate, right? Their love becomes microaggression. Um, and if we can't solve that problem for ourselves, we're not going to be able to solve the, mi the macroaggressions, right? So if people who truly love each other are, are, are still able to hurt each other because they can't hold each other, um, that's a problem. And so I got, I, we got really excited about figuring out, like, how do we tell a story in which we can just show the beauty of what it feels like to pay attention to something or someone? And so at the end of the movie, when she's looking at someone and understanding all their different, you know, facets, that is a, a, the, a very active heroic uh, attempt to pay attention. And I think uh, in a world that is, you know, spends billions and billions of dollars every year to steal your attention, one of the most brave things you can do is try to pay attention to something that actually matters. Um, next question. Um, okay, I saw you in the front. And I'll, I'll do some in the back next, I'm sorry. Uh, did you guys hear that? Okay, first question: Why the mom and why why did the mom and daughter come together in the end? Why didn't why didn't Joy just get to go? Um, and the second question is: uh, Why does everyone love me so much? Um, no, uh, <laughs> why did people? Why did this film connect with people? Um, I can answer that one first. No, uh, I'll say that one first. So the the you said you're you're from you're from China, yes? Um, we have really weird, strange relationships with our parents. Um, they love us so much that it hurts, you know, <laughs> it's uh, they care so deeply that they, they, they strangle us um, And they don't mean to it's just because oftentimes um, that culture it, it's all about um, Making sure that your kid especially for immigrant parents They work so hard because they're so worried that you won't survive in this country, right? And so they want to make sure that you become tough so that you can survive um, and that ends up obviously doing a lot of stuff to our brains um, the ending is a, like, uh, <laughs> I was talking about this during lunch, at lunch again. We had a very long lunch. Um, <laughs> so sorry sorry to anyone who was already at lunch and heard this. Um, I've, been, I've been talking a lot about how The Matrix was a huge inspiration for this film. And The Matrix, what we wanted to do was we were like, ah, I don't want to copy The Matrix, but I do want to capture the feeling I felt when I saw The Matrix for the first time in the 90s as like a 13-year-old, right? Um, how, you guys all seen The Matrix? Yeah? <laughs> Um, watching it today is a very different experience from watching it back then. In the 1990s, everything was about monoculture. Everything was, ab everything was about this corporate um, system where everyone was trapped. Everyone had, was going through the pipeline of, of school to work to retirement, and there was no, it was all homogenous. And so the world at that time really needed 
um, to see that broken, to, to see the mind expand, pull off the goggles. Wow, I'm shattering the monoculture. I'm shattering the system. Um, it's the same reason why Fight Club was so popular the same year. Being, being John Malkovich came out the same year. They're breaking this system that felt so restrictive. Cut, cut to 2022, uh, when the movie came out, we're in the opposite problem. The world is fractured. It's a mess. Uh, the world does not need more stories about how we need to break things. Uh, the world needs stories about how, th how things might come together, even if it feels unrealistic. Like I, I had a lot of people be like, yo, that's an that's a Asian-American immigrant fantasy. <laughs> that's never going to happen. A mom apologizing to their kid. <laughs> and... Uh, that was very intentional for us to be like, <clears throat> um, so there's a, <laughs> there's a difference between extrapolation and imagination. When you use data and science to understand what's going to happen in the future, you get extrapolation. And you will get the thing that is realistic, and you'll get the thing that we deserve, which is uh, parents who won't apologize and let their kids go, or um, climate change ending the world, right? That's extrapolation. When we all feel the doom of climate change, we are reading and learning and, in, and inheriting the story of what is going to happen if we don't have imagination. And the imagination is meant to completely knock us off our orbit, knock us off our trajectory. Um, there's a, uh, a, a system that NASA's been testing out where like, what if Armageddon happens and an asteroid comes and hits us? What do we do? They found one of the most efficient ways to knock a, to stop a, um, an asteroid from hitting us isn't to drill into it and put a nuke there and blow it up. Um, not very efficient, <laughs> especially if you send oil drillers up. That's not very efficient. Um, instead, what they realize is if they can just find, a, they get a little satellite, a small object, like a small uh, drone thing that's just the right weight at just the right speed, at just right the an right angle at the right time, you can just affect the trajectory just enough that by the time it hits us, it just moves by. And I think that's kind of a really important thing for storytellers. You're all storytellers here. It doesn't matter if you're a filmmaker or not. You're all storytellers. Um, to understand is like we've been uh, told or we've been trained to believe that stories don't have power anymore uh, because we see all these stories happen and we see no change happen, right? Nothing, everything's the same. We're still talking about the same stuff I was talking about when I was in college. <laughs> Climate change, racism, it's all, it's income, income inequality. In fact, it's all gotten worse. I graduated during the crash of 2008, 2007, and <laughs> you guys are still dealing with the repercussions of that. Um, but we have to remember that we can be the tiny little satellite that knocks the, <laughs> knocks the trajectory, breaks, the, um, breaks us free from extrapolation if we have strong enough imagination. So that's the reason why the, en the ending is that way. And also that kind of answers your second question. Okay, <laughs> um, thank you. <coughs> I wanna go someone in the way back. Anyone in the way back? Okay, you right there with the gray, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so how did you come to the conclusion? Yeah, how do you, how do you deal with uh, collaboration long-term, especially with conflict? Um, it's not too different from a marriage, honestly. Um, you have to kind of treat it like that. There's, um, <laughs> we kind of do our own version of couples therapy often, uh, and you have to because uh, long-term things, when, when something goes wrong and you don't fix it, it just kind of festers, and then that's, that's a recipe for disaster. Um, and so we do, we do check-ins, we do state of the unions every few years where we just talk about what's working, what's not working, what can we do better, all that stuff. It's real, it's real work. Um, uh, and then the, the other thing about it is just like um, leaving room for the other person to grow into w who they are, if that makes sense, and, and reciprocating that both people do other projects, try other things out, go learn something, come back. Um, you know, if you love something, you, you'll let it go. If it comes back, if it was meant to be, it'll come back, that whole thing. Um, I think that's been really useful for us. Um, okay, next question. Hi, so it's kind of a big question. But um, I was talking with a friend recently, the liberators, actually, he's right here. <laughs> but we were talking about how oftentimes what we like to write about is sort of an idea or a question of like, what are we most afraid of personally? Mm. And I wanted to ask you, what are you afraid of? What do you think about like when you're writing your scripts? Like, what is the big idea or the big question that pops into your head? Great question. Okay. So they're talking about how when they write, they have to ask the big question, which is, what are they most afraid of? 
Um, and what kind of big ideas are we chewing on? And I think it's, I think it's, it's a fantastic way to frame um, writing. Um, I, I think if I knew the answer to the, a big question, I would get really bored halfway through the movie and I'd probably uh, do a bad job. And so for me personally, I have to ask a question I know I will never answer. <laughs> if that makes sense. So I will be chasing this thing up until they take the cut from me, right? Um, and so uh, someone asked me something like this recently, and I, I, I do think that I rate every movie as a way to um, dig myself out of a hole. What hole am I in right now? What, what, is, what, is truly feels, what truly feels um, insurmountable? And so with Everything Everywhere, it was, uh, we started writing around 2016, and if you remember what was happening in 2016, um, we were reading the news, we were, we were following the election, we were seeing the way that the, the country's um, dialogue was moving, and we were seeing how the internet was making it really hard for us to talk to each other, and really hard to, to navigate all the noise and confusion, because like every moment you're, you're like one moment you're, you're reading about what Donald Trump is doing, then you're reading about Kim Kardashian, and then you're seeing like this, some meme about, you know, Pepe for the frog, whatever, it's like, that is, uh, you know, that, that that's why you know, people are always like, why the hot dog hands? Why the, uh, whatever. It's like, that's literally our existence. It's not that weird. In fact, the internet's way weirder than our movies. Like, don't, <laughs> don't overthink it. Um, <laughs> and so I'm always trying to dig myself out of a hole. And if I'm being honest right now, the hole I'm in, I, I have a four-year-old son. I just became a father. Thank you. He's amazing. He's so funny. Um, and the hole I am in, 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 and it's probably a hole that many of you are also um, partially in, uh, is, is just the, the, when I imagine the future my son is going to grow up in, I don't, I don't want to look at it. I don't want to think about it. And it makes it really hard to ignore when you have a son, when you have this embodied person who now is reliant on you. Um, and in this moment, that is the hole I'm digging myself out of. And I'm trying, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to make a movie that saves the world. I don't know. Who knows? How, I don't know how to do it. But that's the thing. You have to ask these questions of like, what, what can I do with what I have? And what, what does that look like? And so that's kind of the big question right now is what can I do? What do I have to offer? How can I show up? Okay. Um, does someone else, do you want to, you want to, I feel, I feel so much pressure picking people. Like, do you, <laughs> Scott, do you, you mind? Randomly, yeah, do you mind? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> you, Henry, and then and then I'll start. Yes. Um, I was just curious that you know you talked about watching the Matrix as a kid and also how much you loved the um, martial arts movies, which I watched them as a kid. And I was curious at what point do you feel like is it ever a struggle to like feel like the thing you're making, you know, the movie, the music video, like that it's distinctly yours, that mm. this is your voice coming through, and not just like. Of course, I did sort of try to create that scene, but you know, how do you feel confident that this is me that is you know, standing up there? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, uh, when you find inspiration or influence, how do you make sure the thing that you're chasing doesn't overcome who you are, your voice as the artist? So how do you make sure you, you find that balance or how do you find that? Um, this is a great question. And like, I, you know, I still struggle to figure out the alchemy of it all, but I, I think early on, I just tried a lot of stuff. And naturally, as you're trying things, you will just chase after things that are working. And the things that are working are often the things that only you have to offer um, in a way that makes it so that you are um, authentically chasing after your own voice, right? Um, but what, ends up, what often ends up happening is you, you have a North Star of like, I want to make something that makes me feel like the Matrix or whatever. And you're going to miss because you suck, right? <laughs> I suck. Everyone's like, you're never, and also, I'm not the Wachowskis. I'm never going to be able to make that. And going into that, knowing that, and jumping this way, and then also having the gravity of, you know, er, you know everything else that, all the other influences, that's going to affect your trajectory in a way that you won't even, you won't even, like, be able to understand. And you'll shoot through it all. It'll pull you in all these different ways, and you're still going to fail. You're going to, you're going to fall flat on your ass. But you're going to be moved, you're going to be in a very different place where you started, and it's that moment when you're on your ass, when you, like, literally want to give up, is when you, you have to look at what you actually have and say, I, don't, I, I can't do that, but I can do this. And that's when you really start to fill in, um, fill in the, the gaps of what you don't have with who you are because you, like, you have nothing else. And so, like, this movie very much so is just a, a long process of 
me realizing I can't do that, but I can do this. And you start to offer up parts of yourself, um, your history, your background, your, your personal tastes, what you're good at, all of those things start to fill it in until, um, and if you chase that authentically, um, I, I think there's no way you can't make something that is yours. Let's go. Let's go over to this side. Get it with your hands way up. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, the question is. Um, how do they come to uh, build the character of joy? Um, and I guess, you know, uh, our, our question asker says it felt very authentic. How do, they, how do they get it close to that thing? And I'll, I'll start with that second question just because I think it's really important. I think things have probably changed now in film school, but when I was growing up, uh, so much emphasis was about um, the auteur knowing everything. You just know what you want. You have a vision. You are, you are the gatekeeper of, 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 of your project. Um, and a lot of it is, is true, it's partially true. Um, but the, the other half of the equation is you really have to open yourself up um, in a vulnerable way in order to get the best out of the people around you. Um, and so that character would not be who she was if it wasn't for Stephanie Hsu, our incredible actress. Um, who put a lot of herself into that. Obviously, it's very, it's like she was playing a version of herself. As she is a queer daughter of immigrants who had to, uh, you know, um, struggle with that and still struggles with that. And so I think that's, answer, that's, that's the answer one is like bring in people. Let, let, let them speak to you. And, and, um, and it's hard as a director to, to be wrong. But like sometimes if something feels false, you have to create a, a good enough environment and collaboration where your collaborator can flag it and say, hey, this something feels off about this and I want to talk about it. Um, and if you can't create a, a, a safe place for those kind of discussions, you'll never be able to get to something more truthful, especially as a, a, a man who has never had that experience, right? Um, and then uh, the other, th the <laughs> you know, the, the less... Um, uh, beautiful and pretty answer for the first question is like like how did how did that happen it's just uh there were drafts where uh there was no joy there were drafts where there was no kid there was drafts where joy was a, a, a son there was drafts where um joy um wasn't even joy was like joe Tupaki was a another character from another family um and uh, you know, writing is a is a is a spiral. It's a it's a it's a, it's running through the woods. It's not a straight path. And so, um, it just was a lot of slowly whittling down until we found what was what was what the story needed. Uh, people always talk about like granite when you're when you're when you're um, sculpting granite. The, the 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 stone speaks to you and tells you what uh, what it wants to be. And that sounds like bullshit, but. Um, it, I, th I think with with uh, with storytelling, I think that's the best way to get to something um, honest is to um, listen to the story and, and, and see what, you know, what what is it trying to be. Um, yeah, I hope that, that's helpful. And thank you again. I, I hope the essay got a good grade. Um, <laughs> Somebody in the middle. And you're asking this question because you're working on a project that is also, okay, great. Um, so the question is, uh, <laughs> when working on the multiverse, how do they find the balance of like what to explain and what not to explain? Um, I, I'm paraphrasing. You, you had a very, you were very articulate and I'm not. So um, <laughs> um, as, as far as exposition goes, I think there's like, or, or, or explaining goes, there's um, uh, factual truth. Right there's like logistical truth, uh, there's emotional truth. Um, there's a lot of different 
categories of, of what is uh, what is worth explaining and what needs to be explained. I think um, understanding everything, like basically understanding that our movie kind of abandons a lot of the explanation and the logic and the the logistics in favor of uh, of emotional truth. And um, at 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 our movie's core, and a lot, I think a lot of stories that really resonate with people, um, that's the most important part. Does this feel um, has the film emotionally uh, revealed itself? Again, it's not explaining. I mean, our movie does explain. It's very on the nose. Um, but has the has the film emotionally revealed itself to me so that I can now um, um, interact with it in a, in in a very open way? I forgot who wrote this, but the, I read a poem about everyone us every one of us having a wilderness. That that is the messy part of us that no one wants to see. And what art allows uh, for is a space in which we can open up our wildernesses and allow them to commingle. Um, and so that's what I mean by e exposing or to reveal. It's not about explaining the thing, but it's to giving us giving a space for your audience to allow their wilderness to uh, engage with yours. And because like I think that's one of the things that um, is very hard to find sometimes. And if you can if you can do that, <laughs> it's very exciting. All the other stuff of like logic on those things. Explain the bare minimum. <laughs> you know what, like what, like what do they need to know to to care about this scene? Um, and like the 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 only other exposition thing I'll say is like, uh, don't explain something before the audience has asked the question first in their head. So as you're writing or as you're watching an edit or whatever, imagine yourself in the shoes of the audience. And if you haven't asked the question, they don't want to hear. Th they don't. They don't want to hear your exposition. So set if you if there's exposition you need to tell. Make them wonder. I wonder what that is. I wonder what that's about. I wonder what that's why, why that happens. So that by the time you're explaining it, it's a relief, you know? Because people are always like, ah, oh, too much exposition. Exposition's not bad. You need exposition. Every story has a version of exposition. It's about how you how you use it and where you put it and how much of it there is. Okay, next question. <laughs> you're doing great, Scott. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. I see what you don't want to do with yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, so the question is um, so our character of Joy, she is queer, son of a uh, daughter of an immigrant. Um, but n those things aren't necessarily central to the plot. Why did I, Why did we decide to go that direction? What is the purpose of this? And I'm, I'm glad you put it that way. I think one of the things we talked to uh, Stephanie about early on was that it was really important to us that the her queerness was not the thing that defined her. It was just a part of her multiverse, right? Her sp the spectrum of who of, of of everything that she exists in, um, which is why at the end of the film, when her mother tries to introduce the girlfriend to her grandfather it's not enough because that's not that's not it's that's not what this whole thing's about that's a part of it and everything builds up to the fact that her mother just doesn't see her um, and it's not about the queerness alone um, but as far as why we went that direction I felt like one of the things that we were um, grappling with at least personally for me it was like I was like what are the things my mother is afraid of my mother used to tell me all that because I you know I I I was wearing uh, girls' jeans and painting my fingernails, and I was very, um, uh, I guess I did, like, things are very different now, but in high school, if you were just, like, even a little bit off, people immediately thought you were gay. And they immediately thought you there was something, you know, my, my masculinity was constantly being um, questioned. Um, and so my mother would, would repeat to me often, like, hey, Daniel, uh, this is funny. She would just, she would just con conjugate the whole sentence into just Daniel straight. <laughs> um, and uh, and you know I internalized that most of my life, and and like I um, and now I think I have a, a healthy relationship with my masculinity and my feminine side. I'm trying, I'm and I'm really grateful for this generation of um, just the queer community who's able to give us words for how to talk about gender and sexuality and all, because we didn't have that when I was growing up. When I grew up, people were like, I don't know, metrosexual? Do you guys remember that term? <laughs> it's, it's bullshit. Um, 
and and so in a lot of ways joy was meant to embody like all like, the sum of all fears for an immigrant chinese mother and it felt like an opportunity to us for us to put center a, a queer character and again not in a necessary queer story so um, i'm glad it resonated and i'm glad we found the balance that worked for you so thank you Um, trying to think of how to answer this just because I don't want you to take you know I don't I, I want you to find your own way obviously I think because abstraction is is the, the whole point of it is that you can't lock it down there's no way to label it I'm afraid of saying too much and then suddenly your your abstraction is now locked down in my my way of seeing right um, we are we are all translators, right? Uh, storytelling is translation. We are trying to translate the chaos and the abstract and the unknowable and undefinable into something that we can all look at. And it becomes a, a way for us to, to basically ask the question, do you see what I see, right? And that's, that's, that's really what you need to be thinking about. So when you think about the abstract thing, who are you trying to translate to? What is the audience? And what, are you, what, what filter are you going to take this abstract thing so that they can understand it? Um, I think abstraction for the sake of abstraction, I think um, obtuseness and, and um, um, I don't want to say subtlety. Subtlety is great. Just um, making things unclear for the sake of making things unclear is, is um, there's a place and time for it, but I do think uh, at least in some parts of our industry, people love that. People like to make things that, you know, like, oh, I wonder what the ending means. It's ambiguous. How does, it, how does that make me feel? That's really important. But I think right now in a time in which uh, misinformation is spreading rapidly and everyone is seeing whatever version of the truth that they want to see, um, making, like, making things that can't be misinterpreted is actually really important and requires a lot of precision. And so how do you create the... Uh, <laughs> And again, not everyone has to do it. This is just like something I, I believe. Look at the Matrix. They're, one of their central metaphors, the red pill, has been co-opted by uh, you know, conservative right-leaning people. This is from two trans women filmmakers who were like, you know, anarchists fighting you know, capitalist systems. This is because our metaphors have become so slippery that it becomes really, like, I don't, again, I don't know if this, am I spreading uh, a, a, you know, old wives' tale, but... Uh, Osama bin Laden loves video games, and he loves Star Wars. Star Wars is about a bunch of rebels taking a plane and blowing up something because they believed that they were right. And so we have to be really careful. And I'm going on a tangent because I'm just because abstraction is, is, is such an interesting thing. How do we make sure we're making stuff that is um, abstract enough that allows a lot of room for the audience to um, grow into it? but not so abstract that anyone can take it and weaponize your story or weaponize your power, you know? Um, and I think a lot of the big, block, 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 big blockbuster movies, things are vague enough that they can be misinterpreted any way they want to so they can get as many seats in, in the theaters as much as they want to, but then you become a tool for a, <laughs> you know, at best, um, a narrative that is upholding the status quo and at worst is really destructive and hurtful to potentially marginalized people or to just... Um, yeah, uh, people who are most vulnerable. Um, so uh, I, I went on a real, <laughs> I went on a real tear there. I'm sorry. I hope that's helpful. Translate the thing. Translate the thing, but try to find, try to find something truthful and clear. Okay. Hey, I'm feeling back. Um, you know, long, long hair. You know, yeah. I don't want to be surprised. Great questions. Okay, first question is, how do you know what you're making is good? How do you know when it's good enough to put out there? How do you know when there's so many collaborators in the voice voices? How do you know it's actually a good idea? And the second question is, what makes me laugh? It's a good question. Um, the I, I, uh, we, we, we brought our, our first film to Sundance, and it, it's kind of an insane movie just because it was a, sort of a joke. We didn't tell anyone it was a farting corpse movie. Um, <laughs> and then at the premiere, everyone thought it was going to be a drama about Paul Dano you know, and Dan Radcliffe trying to survive. Um, but we tested that movie a lot because we didn't know what we, didn't know what we were 
doing. It was our first movie. Um, our editor forced us to show a cut of the movie um, every two weeks. After after our first cut, we had to show a version of it to someone who had never seen of it, seen it or heard of it every two weeks for the entire duration of the shoot. Um, and it, it is there is engineering to this. You know, on the one end, it's, it's super creative, but there there is a little bit of engineering. Um, either that year or the year before I was talking to a filmmaker and they said, no one has seen our movie yet. We're the only ones in this room, um, the, like the three of us. We were the only ones who saw it. We're so excited because, you know, we protected our vision and now we're going to show it to people. And that's fine. And like everyone has a different process. Um, but you're opening yourself up to a lot of, um, I don't know, it's uh, like pain and confusion when you aren't willing to allow uh, sort of the the sanding process of the create of the creative process to happen the sharpening that happens you know flint sharpens flint and that's a that is a painful process but you do get to something closer because you like short films this is true but especially feature films you do not understand your own movie like as you work on it you get you have no distance and you really don't know what you have um and so finding the people that you trust and saving them for you know like I don't let, we don't let most of our friends read our scripts um, so that we can then show them the feature, the, the edit later, you know, or, and like the people who we do show the scripts, we don't show the edit later. You know, it's, it's a whole thing where there's a strategy of surrounding yourself with people you trust with very different tastes and very different opinions. Um, and you don't have to take any of their notes, but it's worth hearing and seeing and feeling it. Um, so that's, that's one way. It's just a lot of feedback and it's painful. I hated it in college. I never showed anyone anything and I, and I had to learn how to do that. Um, what makes me laugh? Uh, <laughs> I won't say that. Um, <laughs> the um, I'm very lucky to have a community of of fellow filmmakers who are all doing very interesting things. And um, when I get to really uh, forget about the world is when I'm just in communion with them, eating and talking and exploring and thinking about these big picture things. Um, it is, I don't know, it feels very alive, it feels very fun, um, and also feels very generative. Um, Adrian Marie Brown talks about like activism and pleasure activism, right? A lot of people think activism is a sacrifice, it's hard work, all this stuff. Um, pleasure activism is trying to uh, re-engineer that and flip it on its head and say, what if the good work is also the most pleasurable work? What if it's the most fun? What if it's the most, uh, she even says like erotic, like, or, or they, sorry, they even say that their most erotic work is the good work. Um, and so, Often, oftentimes, like when I'm chewing on the big stuff and doing it with the people I care about, like I find a lot of joy there. And it's, <laughs> it's such a boring answer, <laughs> but it's true. We're done about two more before we go out. So, you, sir, way in the back on the edge, pointing yourself. Yeah. You Can you hear me from here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, how did I transition from the uh, really, really cool music videos I did uh, to feature films? Um, it was a uh, very slow process. Moving from music videos to features is really hard because um, you learn a lot of bad habits in music videos and also uh, not many people uh, are willing to trust music video directors to, to jump into narrative um, because uh, most people don't get training in how to work with actors or how to even think about story when they're doing music videos. Um, but for us, we turned every single music video into an opportunity for a story. And so people were able to see that and say, oh, I can, I can totally understand how you would take this narrative and uh, stretch it out and turn it into a feature or TV or whatever. Um, but what we did early on, and it's, it's worth um, pointing this out, is our first year of um, being like officially music video directors, where like, I quit my job and we, we went for it. Uh, we were pitching on like a song every, you know, two or three songs a week sometimes, um, which meant we would be creating treatments and doing, how many of you guys have done like short film treatments or music video treatments? It's a lot of work. You have to type up a whole thing. You have to come up with the idea, write the idea, final images. We were pumping these out two or three times a week for a whole year and we lost everything. <laughs> Uh, we, we won one job but it's because we did whatever the, the band told us to do because we got so desperate. Um, and after that year, we almost quit uh, because we weren't willing to compromise. Um, 
or uh, we weren't, we were, there were certain things about us we weren't willing to compromise. Um, and when we did compromise it, the work came out bad. And so we were like, I guess we're not made for this. This is not going to be our path forward. Uh, but what was happening in the background that we didn't realize was our, our, our incredibly stupid pitches that probably should never have been sent. Like we were, just, we were just sending these ideas that no one was ever going to say yes to. And we kind of knew that um, into the, the void. And all the music video commissioners who were working at the labels were passing them around because they thought they were hilarious. They're like, what the hell? They thought this was a good idea for blonde redhead or like for Beyonce. Beyonce's not going to say yes to this. It was just, a, it was this thing where people were talking about us and, our, and we were clearly developing a style for really wanting ambitious story, interesting visual effects, and uh, just absurd imagery. And so finally someone saw some, some, some of our treatments and was like, um, they, they told us after later, it was like, my year end, at the end of that year where we thought we were going to quit, he said, my New Year's resolution is to work with those guys on something. Um, and that was uh, Brian Younts at Columbia Records, and he gave us uh, a chance on a music video for Manchester Orchestra, which was, at the time, the biggest thing we'd ever done. And that thing really just, like, propelled us. Um, and the reason why I tell you that story is because they're, they're, you have to be really careful in this industry um, because you obviously have to compromise. You obviously have to do things you don't want to do. But this industry is so cutthroat that it will tell you to do that over and over again and ask of it, uh, ask that of you over and over again to ask you, will you compromise this ab about yourself or compromise this part of, of your voice? Um, and past a certain point, you have to just uh, say no and just do the thing you want to do. Because if you do the compromise thing and that goes out, Every other client will be like, oh, that's what that person does. They do that. That's, that's your calling card now. Um, and so we had to work other jobs. I, I lived in the garage, and I was uh, eating taco trucks most nights. It was like we had to compromise a lot to figure out how to do that, how to say no. Um, and I know it's, it's even a privilege for us to be able to, to be doing that, but um, to, be, to, have, to feel safe enough to be able to say no to a lot of things or to push ourselves on a lot of things like, uh, like un in un uncompromising ways. But I do think it's really important for people to understand that it's, uh, that is how we have our, our style and that's how we were able to keep continue making our style all the way up until music videos because we kept proving ourselves and showing this is what I want to do. I don't want to do that. Um, okay. First question is, um, does Joy want to die? And um, if Joy want to die, is it because of her mom? And is like this universe uh, <coughs> kind of like her mom's imagination, or it's a real universe that Joy want to die and drag her mom into? And the second question is, when you are starting a project that is almost like impossible to finish. How do you convince people to uh, give you ah. <laughs> Yeah, that's always the question. Um, the first, your first question is about, um, is joy suicidal? And um, how much of it is this is real, or is it imagined in the mother's mind? Um, both of our feature films deal with um, s uh, suicidal ideation, and it's something that I, uh, yeah, I grew up with. Um, when you have no foundation and you don't have an anchor, um, or I, I'd say when you don't have a consistent foundation, a consistent anchor, it becomes very hard for you to know um, why to why why do you get up in the morning? Um, and I think this film is trying to capture a feeling that I think is um, there's this neuroanthropologist named Jamie Wheel who talks about when you are bombarded by narratives and stories and all these contradictory ideas, you can. F kind of push yourself to one of two directions. Either you you hold on to your beliefs even harder, you become even more extreme, and you become even more dogmatic. And you can see that happening in the world all around us, right? And, and like even myself, I'm even more dogmatic in my beliefs because I'm trying to protect myself. The other side of it is you just give up. <laughs> if there's too many nor narratives, too many things that are contradictory, you say nothing matters and you give up. And I can see that in the world, and I could see myself in that, and I can I I have been very lucky to find a foundation in my life, or many foundations in my life that make it so that I, unless it's like a weird side effect for a pharmaceutical drug I'm taking, um, I su suicidal ideation doesn't has not come back really um, in my adult life. 
Um, and it, it felt really important to me to just acknowledge that those ideas come in the na narrative chaos of living with the internet and to allow people to see a version of themselves move through that in a way that it show them it's possible. So, and to answer your question, yes, it is, it's, it's very real. Um, the multiverse, like, I, I, I like movies that are just very literal. This is, this is happening in the movie. It's, it's, it's super fantastic. It's not in her head. Um, but uh, I hope that answers your question. And then the second question, I don't know. Oh, how do you get money? Um, <laughs> Don't talk about suicidal ideation. Um, <laughs> um, see, that's what makes me laugh, the suicide jokes. This is great. Um, um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think, because I don't, again, I don't want to influence you guys in a way. Like, find, like, there's a, there's a Venn diagram of four things that I like to look at when I'm thinking about, oh, what's the next project I'm going to do? Um, and like, can I get all four of those? Uh, can, I, can I hit the bullseye between those four circles? And the first thing is, um, what are you good at? You know, does this project actually tap into something, my, one of my talents? Um, what do you love? Is it tapping into something that I did, I, I'm passionate about, that I'm excited about, that will get me out of the bed in the morning? Um, what does the world need? Um, will it challenge me to offer something to the conversation and to um, you know, interact with the world in that way? And then the last thing is, what will get you paid? <laughs> um, because uh, a starving artist will never really be able to, um, I mean, it happens, you can sometimes break out, but it's really hard to sustain that life um, unless you're very lucky. And so, um, and I also find that intersection is actually really helpful because sometimes we move, move too far one direction and then we say, oh shoot, this is never gonna get us money. How, in what way can I bring it over here without compromising what I'm good at and what I love and what the world needs? Um, and so find that intersection of like, honestly, what I, what, what I love and what will make me money is like Kung Fu movies. I fucking love Kung Fu movies and that's gonna make me, that's gonna get me money. That, that's like Michelle Yeoh, love Michelle Yeoh that's going to get me money. And so just thinking of those things as wins and making sure you don't go too far. Because if you start doing too much of it and you start losing what you're good at and losing what the world needs, then you're making a commercial, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, I, I hope that's useful. Everything, everything kind of exists in the dialectic. And you have to be balancing constantly. And um, it, you <laughs> every project's different. And you, you'll have different questions and challenges with every project. Um, thanks, guys. I think that's the last question. Thank you so much. Yeah.